I, I'm, I really have to leave. I really have to leave. So, sorry. Sorry. No, one more, one more. Come here. There, perfect, perfect. Hi, guys. Hi. Afternoon. Morning. Oh, I shake, but sorry. Here, here. Come here, come here. Thanks. 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 Hi, guys. Ryan, you're the man. Come here. It was... I'm sorry, you're in my way. It just moved that way a little bit. There, there you go. You're perfect. Now. <laughs> oh, Barbara, it's so good to see you again. I just saw you five minutes ago, but it feels like it was yesterday. <laughs> Hi, guys. I'll tell you what. This looks like the perfect spot for you all. Why don't you? I know. Here, one more. Thank you. Thank you. Please, have a seat. <laughs> Today is my birthday, and you are my gift. Therefore, I insist that you love my sermon and speak of it often. When Pastor Ed asked me to preach on the High Impact series, I was thrilled because it gave me motivation to increase my own impact as a minister. After listening to Pastor Ed's sermon last week and Pastor Chinda's messages on the two Sundays prior, I knew just what to do. First, I needed to increase my reach, increase my audience, get better glasses. I needed to increase my audience. So, I may have leaked to the press that I was about to become spiritual advisor to beleaguered pop star Justin Bieber, and, and you see what happens? I have my own paparazzi now. But you know, now the entire world can see me in action like you just did and hang on my every word. Please, please, enough, enough. But to truly have a high impact, increasing my audience alone is not enough. Somehow everyone must know that my words are important, that my views carry weight. Then I hit upon it. Angels. That's right, I'll use an angelic choir to emphasize my genius. For example, I might say, I believe the Lego movie is a metaphor for the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh. Or, I believe every Christian should like God on Facebook. So now, I really am a high-impact minister. I can reach a vast international audience where I can share my own personal insights about current events, the world, culture, and, and God. Does anyone else hear anything wrong in what they just saw or heard? I count at least three things, three problems Four, if you count the malfunctioning sunglasses. First, it was all about me. Nothing I was doing was for the glory of God or in service to God's mission. And second, who cares about my insights? As a high-impact Christian, I should be bringing the love of Christ, not sharing my own cleverness or wisdom. Finally, I'm assuming that to be a high-impact Christian, I have to reach a lot of people, when in reality, we often have the most impact in one-on-one -on -one settings, 
meeting people where they are. And this is where we will focus our message today. I have to share this with you. On Friday night, my wife Pam and I were with our friend Michael. Michael is a person who's skeptical of organized religion. I told Michael I was writing a sermon on being a high-impact Christian. He asked what a high-impact Christian was, and then he answered his own question. He said, a high-impact Christian has both a cross and a fish on the back of their car. Now, I believe... Please. I believe... I'm sorry, we're, we're done with that for now, okay? Can we just hold it for a minute? They're so anxious. I believe that we can have the highest impact as Christians when we make ourselves available to others, when we speak directly with people in need, when we take the time to listen to people who need to share their burden. It's long been a tradition in the church that we share our call stories, how we believe, each of us, that God is engaging us in the work of the kingdom. An important part of my story is that I believe that God has called me to work in both ministry and corporate America. And this has become increasingly clear to me in the past several years. Many of you know that in addition to being a pastor here at Mount Olivet, I work full-time at Freddie Mac, where I am Director of Finance Initiative Strategy. They're going to work with me tomorrow. I've been at Freddie Mac for 27 years, four months longer than I've been married to Pam. Five years ago, in the midst of tragedy, I stumbled into what I thought was a high-impact moment as a Christian. Sadly, our chief financial officer took his own life. Later that very day, I had a visit from our human resources team. They were organizing a small memorial event, heard that I was in seminary, and asked if I would open the memorial with a prayer. I said, of, of course. Later that afternoon, I was visited by corporate communications. They knew of my role in the memorial and nervously asked that I not speak of God, faith, prayer, Jesus, church, Christianity, or angels. I laughed. I assured them that I would not because, you see, between those two meetings with human resources and corporate communications, I had called David McAllister Wilson, the president of Wesley Seminary. You, you may remember David. He preached from this pulpit earlier this year. I explained the situation to David, and he suggested the same thing as corporate communications. This was a time for healing, not a time to be controversial. Over the next several days, this small memorial event turned into a large service of remembrance. A couple of thousand people packed into Freddie Mac's auditorium, and the service was streamed to every desktop in the company. I was introduced as a seminarian and future minister. I now had a huge audience, an audience for my prayer, but that isn't the high impact in this story. The high impact came later. You see, I had now been exposed as a Christian, as a seminarian, and as a minister. Almost immediately, that afternoon, people began to drop by my office to chat, sharing their concerns and their pain. And these are people I didn't know in many cases. I bought box after box of tissues, kept them on my desk, and I learned quickly that one of the most important jobs of the high-impact Christian, you may want to write this down, shut up and listen. Often our highest impact as Christians can be when we are with only one person, when we do nothing, when we make ourselves available to just be, to just be Christ's love for people who need it. Here's an example. A few months after my exposure as a Christian, I was walking down the hall at Freddie Mac. 
Coming the other way was a coworker that I'll refer to as Cecil. Cecil was looking at the floor, his shoulders drooped, and just as Cecil passed me, I heard, <sighs> I stopped. I asked Cecil if everything was all right. Cecil, who didn't really know me at all, told me a friend of his had just died and that he and others had cared for this friend in the final stages of a long illness. He wondered if he had done enough for his friend. My mind raced. I was searching for something meaningful that would ease Cecil's pain, something I could say that would take away his burden. But Cecil kept talking. It dawned on me that Cecil didn't need to hear me. Cecil needed me to hear him. We parted 10 minutes later, and I said almost nothing the entire time. But Cecil walked away, smiling, shoulders straight, relaxed. This has been a hard lesson for me. In our culture of achievement, I used to think that to have an impact, I had to do work with every person I came in contact with. I had to be insightful, witty, and wise. I had to tell them something that would change their lives. It was almost like keeping score and to win, I had to play an active role in the faith journeys of every person I came in contact with. But the times I really seemed to impact someone was the time, were the times I was just there for them. This distinction was made clear to me one day when I was lunching with two overtly Christian friends. One had just returned from a mission trip where he had led vacation Bible school for Native American children. The other friend asked, how many children did you save for Christ? Well, the missionary said, well, none. My job was to just love them. I assumed I needed results to be high impact. I thought I had to chase down people and tell them what to believe, to convert them to my faith. I alone was responsible for my results for my impact, and guess what? I was awful at doing it, I hated doing it, and it never worked. Perhaps that is because I was accepting the wisdom of the world. I was focused on achievement, self-reliance, on getting things done. Yet our scripture throughout this sermon series has been 1 Corinthians, and we have heard over and over that human wisdom is foolishness to God, and God's wisdom is foolishness to humans. God invites us to join God's work, not try to align our work to God. But make no mistake, making yourself available, listening, just being with people is work, and it's sometimes hard work. I am actually an introvert, and being with people like you completely drains me, especially you. <laughs> I was teasing Stephen. 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 Look at, no, no, not yet. Okay. We're good. It can be harder to let people know of your relationship to Christ, your faith, your hope, and not put up a barrier to that relationship right away. But I believe that faith, that hope, that belief in God is where our strength lies. We're listening not because we're thoughtful. We're listening because it is our mission that came from God. There may be two people in the room in these conversations, but God is fully participating. I, I have to admit, my conversations with people at Freddie Mac are much easier because most everyone knows I'm a Christian and I don't have to explain it before we talk. Interestingly, knowing that I'm a minister is much less off-putting than I assumed it would be. Recently, I co-hosted a retirement event for a coworker. At the party, I spoke with an acquaintance from Freddie Mac, someone I didn't really know well. 
He said he heard that I was a minister and followed with a statement that I've become accustomed to hearing. Ed, I don't know if you've ever heard this one. It was a very apologetic, but I don't go to church. I laughed and told him that was okay. I didn't always go to church. And I asked, I asked how he was doing, and he then asked if we could get together for lunch and talk. We're having lunch this Friday. You see, God gives us opportunity after opportunity to have a high impact in our world. And our challenge is to be open to these opportunities and trust that God will be with us. God will tell us what to say and what to do. I no longer worry that I'm inadequate. I know that I'm inadequate. But I also know that God is more than adequate and God will will be there when I need him. I can trust that God will tell me what to say, tell me what to do, and show me where to be. The bottom line is this. It doesn't matter how old we are, how mature we are in our Christianity, how theologically trained we are. We can each impact people's lives for Christ. It doesn't matter if we're Wesley Seminary graduates or Duke Divinity School graduates, if we've just joined AARP or we're in our first year of high school, our work is making ourselves available to the opportunities God puts in front of us to connect with each other, to listen, and to just be with a person who needs us. I believe there is no circumstance where we can have a higher impact than when we share the burden, the story, and the life of another person. Amen.